Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Episode 85, Hini Moa and Tutanikai. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. In the midst of tales of battle and sudden death, of gigantic feasting and fabulous monsters, of the unearthly Patupayarehe, the strange fairies of the forest, comes the simple love tale of Hinemoa and Tutanikai. On the island of Makoya, set like a jewel on the shining surface of Rotorua, Tutanikai lived with his mother and stepfather and his half-brothers. Cut off from the people of the mainland, They lived their placid island life untroubled by the tribal wars that raged among the people of the lakeshore. But they were not entirely isolated. Now and again, the waka that visited the mainland brought back news of the outer world. It was in a way such as this that Tutanikai and his brothers came to hear of Hinemoa, the beautiful high-born girl of Ōwhata. All who spoke of her told of her gentleness and beauty and strength of character. These reports so stirred the brothers that they fell in love with her before they ever saw her. The brothers of Tutanikai each boasted that they would take her to be their wife, but Tutanikai himself said nothing. He went onto the balcony of his hillside whare at night and looked across the dark water towards Ōwhata. Then he would sigh, and after a while he would bring out his flute and breathe a love song into it. The music carried clearly across the water, and Hinemoa, sitting in the moonlight with her friends, would fall silent. The steam by the lakeside drifted above the manuka, restless and lost, like the thoughts of Hinemoa. She had heard of the brothers of Makoya, and she would smile to herself and say, that is the music of Tutanikai. One day, there was a great meeting of the tribes on the mainland. Hinemoa was there with her people, and her eyes sought out Tutanikai. Some instinct seemed to tell her that the tall, handsome young man was the flute player of the moonlit nights. As for Tutanikai, he had seen many young girls. But of all the lovely young women of Rotorua who were gathered in the marae, it was only Hinemoa who attracted him. In this way, they became lovers. Yet neither Hinemoa nor Tutanikai declared their love. The young woman of Ōwhata was a highborn of the line of the rangatira, Apuhi, and although he loved her, Tutanikai feared he would be refused. Yet at every gathering he sought her and spoke to her in a friendly fashion. Finally, he decided to send a message to her through a friend. When this friend had told of Tutanikai's love, Hinemoa said simply, Ehu, have we then each loved alike? The next time the tribes gathered together, the lovers met outside the marae. No one missed them, for the whare was full. While the laughter and cries of the dancers were loud in their ears, they sat outside in the darkness, and Tutanikai told Hinemoa his words of love. How shall we meet? he asked. Hinemoa's voice replied softly, I will come to you, Tutanikai, my beloved. I must go when no one suspects, and you must be ready for me. How shall I know when you'll be waiting? Tutanikai thought for a moment. Already the music has carried my love to you across the waters of Rotorua. Now let it bear another message, the message that I am waiting for you. When you hear the music in the silence of the night, you will know that I am looking for your waka to steal across the shadowed lake. The next night, Hinemoa heard the distant flute and stole down to the shore of the lake where the waka were kept. They were all there, but alas, someone had beached them, and they were high up on the land. Not a single waka was floating in the water. She could hear the music clearly across the water where the island of Makoya lay sleeping on the quiet lake. Hinemoa, Hinemoa, called the flute. Hinemoa, 
and her heart was heavy in her because of her longing for her lover. However, she was forced to turn away. Her people must have seen the manner of Tutanikai's glance in the marae. Perhaps someone heard them whispering in the darkness, for it was unusual that all the waka be beached at the same time. The following night, she went back to the lakeside, but still the waka were high and dry, and her suspicion turned to certainty. Every night Tutanikai's music called to her. The moon waxed and waned, while love for him stirred in her so that she could not sleep, and the distant flute seemed to thunder in her ears. With her eyes closely shut, she could see Tutanikai on the balcony of his whare, blowing into the long putorino, and then sitting down and straining his eyes to see if he could catch sight of the darker shape of a waka amongst the shadows. Then came the moonless nights, and she could wait no longer. The rows of waka had mocked her every night, and she did not even glance towards them. She had prepared six large dried hue, tying them together with harakeke so that they would support her in the water. As she went to the little beach, Tutanikai's music sounded again, and she quickened her resolve. She threw off her single garment, a cloak of finely woven harakeke, tied the hue under her armpits, and waded out until she found herself being lifted by the waves. She struck out boldly. She felt like a bird which has escaped from a cage. Presently, the lapping of the waves seemed to drown the sound of the flute. Perhaps a current of the ear had carried the sound away from her, but she felt a moment of panic. The darkness pressed down on her like a solid wall. She tried to lift herself up to see if the island was close at hand, but the darkness closed in on her. She had lost her sense of direction. She could not tell where Makoya lay, nor the beach she had left. Her arms were tired, and the hue seemed to have lost their buoyancy, so that the little waves struck her cruelly across the face, the water icy cold. She gave a cry of despair as something brushed against her face. Then, with a sob of relief, she caught hold of it and rested against it. It was a tree trunk floating in the water. As she held closely to it and raised herself a little above the waves, the wind brought the sound of the flute back to her ears. She pushed away from the log and began to swim steadily towards the music. The gloom had lightened and she could see even the bulk of the island against the faint starlight. Sometimes she grew tired and rested, but her panic was over. At one point, the current carried her away from the island, but she swam more strongly and felt the water surging under her. The time passed slowly, and the water grew colder. Then, the music stopped, and the only sound was the ceaseless lapping of the waves against her breast. She stopped and listened. At first, she could hear nothing. Then, a tiny sound, a crash and a hiss, like a wave falling on the sand and running up the slope of a beach. Another hiss as it drained away, carrying a myriad grains of sand with it. A moment later, she felt the ground under her feet. She stumbled upon the beach, half frozen. The cold wind numbed her flesh even more than the lake water. Feeling her way with her hands in front of her, she came upon some rocks. They were warm, and she could smell the sulphur-laden steam of a hot pool. She had been on the island once before, so she knew where she was. This was the hot pool of Waikimihia, directly below Tutanikai's whare. She lowered herself gratefully into the water, and felt warmth soaking into her chilled body. Now that she had reached her lover's home, and the dangers of the journey were behind her, she suddenly felt shy and reluctant to appear before him. Her clothes still lay far away on the beach at Orfata. Then came the sound of footsteps descending the path towards Waikamehia. In a flash, she pulled herself towards the bank and crouched under the overhanging rock. The footsteps stopped. Something dropped into the pool, and she heard water gurgling into a calabash close by her side. 
Disguising her voice, she said in a deep tone, Where are you taking the water? Who are you? The man who was fetching the water started at the voice coming from the darkness. Oh, I, I'm the slave of Tutanikai. I'm, I'm taking the water to him. Hinemoa's heart leaped. Give me the calabash, she said, still pretending to be a man. She spoke so confidently that the slave handed the calabash to her without any protest. She put it to her lips and drank. Then, rising her arm, she hurled the empty vessel across the pool so it smashed against the rocks on the further side. The slave cried out, half in fear and half in anger. Why have you done that? That was Tutanikai's calabash! Hinemoa made no reply, but only drew back further into the shadow of the rock. The slave looked carefully over the stones, but could see nothing. Who are you? he called shrilly, and when there was no reply, he turned and ran up to the fuddy. What is the matter? Tutanikai exclaimed as he saw the slave's face. What has happened? Where is the water I told you to bring? The, uh, the calabash is broken. Well, who broke it? The, the man in, in the pool. Tutanikai looked at him closely. Can you not speak more clearly? Who broke it? The man in the pool, the slave repeated doggedly. For a moment, Tutanikai thought of going down to find out for himself, but he changed his mind. Night after night he had played his flute, but Hinemoa had forgotten. He turned his face to the wall and said wearily, Ugh, take another calabash and, and fetch the water. The slave departed on his errand a second time. He looked around cautiously, but there was no sign of any stranger. Yet, no sooner had he dipped the calabash in the pool, than the deep voice called out. If the water is for Tatanikai, give it to me. The slave's legs trembled, but he held out the calabash at arm's length. A hand emerged out of the shadows, and again the calabash crashed against the rocks and broke. This time, the man did not wait to protest. He ran up the winding path as swiftly as his legs would carry him. The second calabash! It's been broken by the man at the pool! He gasped. Tutanikai shut his eyes. Take another calabash, he said in a flat voice. In a little while, the slave stood before him empty-handed once more. At last, Tutanikai felt the anger rising swiftly in him. He forgot his longing for Hinemoa. With one swift movement, he sprang to his feet, caught up his mere, and ran down to the pool. Hinemoa heard him coming and knew it was her lover. The slave's footsteps had been heavy and slow. Tutanikai was running lightly and swiftly. She crouched still further under the rocks and held her breath as the footsteps stopped on the brink of the pool. The moon was rising, and she saw his shadow lying across the water. Under the rocks, the darkness lay heavily. Where are you, breaker of pots? called Tutanikai. Come out, so that I can see you. Show yourself like a man, instead of hiding like a coda in the-